In April of 2003, I found myself in a fighting hole facing north along this highway, Highway 7, in southern Iraq, the main avenue of advance for American forces during the early days of the Iraqi invasion. I was a Marine in 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines, and we had just survived the first major contact in the war in a place called Nasiriyah where we'd been ambushed. My guys and I were tired, we were hungry, and we were terrified. Southern Iraq at the time was one of the poorest places in the world. There was no access to health care, no access to education. It was a terrible hunger problem. And what had been happening as we advanced north was the regular army had been retreating to make a final stand in Baghdad. And Saddam had been pushing his Fedayeen soldiers, special forces guys, south. And they were going hut to hut in these rural villages, coercing poor farmers to fight us. Basically saying, look, your children are starving right in front of you. We will drop a bag of rice off here every week if you'll pick up this weapon and go fight these guys 10 miles south of here. We were fighting these guys by the hundreds and thousands. And that set the stage for what happened that morning. So I got up out of my fighting hole and I walked the lines to check my guys because they were scared. And I looked up and I saw a small white car approaching our position from on this highway. So I thought they packed bombs in these cars they're going to try to blow, it, uh, blow the car up in our position. So I grabbed three of my guys, we took off running toward the car to try to get it to stop. And I fired a warning shot across the hood of the car. Finally, the car stops about 50 meters out. The driver hops out of the driver's side, starts waving his arms frantically and running at us. So now I think this guy's strapped a bond to himself. He's going to try to blow himself up in our position. So I'm yelling at him in Arabic to try to get him down, to get him to get down on the ground, but he's not listening. Just as I raise my weapon up, thinking I have to take this guy out, I look behind him, and I see a large black military truck roll up behind his little white car, Six guys in black jump out of the truck, run up to the car, and they start shooting into the car. This man stopped dead in his tracks, started screaming, turned around and started sprinting back to his car. And that's when I realized what was happening. You see, this guy was one of these poor farmers who was just trying to escape across our lines with his family. So I yelled at my guys to take out the Fetty, and I ran as fast as I could to try to get there to save this guy's family. But by the time I got there, it was too late. I looked in the passenger side. His wife was slumped over dead. She'd been shot in the face and in the chest. He had a little baby girl in the back whose arm had been shot off and she'd been shot in the face. He was cradling the body of his little six-year-old daughter who had been shot in the stomach and she was choking on her own blood. This guy was beside himself. In two seconds, he lost everything he had in this world. And for the first time in the war, everything slowed down for me. And I put myself in this man's shoes. And I thought to myself, I wake up every morning with so many choices. What do I have for breakfast? Where do I want to go to school? Where do I want my kids to grow up? What were this guy's choices when he woke up this morning? He could watch his kids starve to death. He could strap a bomb to himself. He could make some desperate attempt to cross our lines knowing the Fetty were right next door. This guy didn't have any choices. And I didn't know what to do. So I just kind of let my weapon hang on my side and I started crying with this guy. But then I got really, really angry. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair that the GPS coordinates of a man's birthplace dictated what choices he had in this world. And that was the beginning of an awakening in me, a journey that put me on a very different path in life. You see, I began to think that maybe, perhaps, I could make more of an impact in the world on terror if I took on what I believe is the leading contributor to the proliferation of terrorism, insurgency, and global instability, which is extreme poverty. So I made one of the toughest decisions I ever made in my life. I left my guys. I left the Marine Corps. And many of them were cheering me on. They saw the same things. They thought maybe I can make more of an impact this way. But you see, when I got out, I didn't want to just help a couple villagers in some random village in, in Africa. I wanted to scale a company that could have a global impact in this fight. Because, you see, I had left everything I knew in this world. These guys, these brothers that I loved, I had to leave them behind. So I had to make, I had to make this count. I had one shot. So I decided to go to business school to learn how to build a high-quality company to deliver a high-quality product in the fight against extreme poverty. I applied to Stanford and Harvard, and by some miracle of God, got in. Decided to go to Stanford because of the focus on social innovation and entrepreneurship. And an amazing thing happened there at school. Over 30 of my classmates got involved in helping me build the model. Six faculty, uh, faculty got involved with, 
with seed funding, mentorship, and advice. And when I graduated in June of 2008, we'd raised $450,000 to start the project. I moved to Southwest Kenya in September of that same year to launch the pilot project of what became known as Nuru International, a groundbreaking new approach to fighting the problem of extreme poverty. We started with just a handful of farmers that fall, and, and since that time, five years later, we've grown to impacting over 30,000 people in both Kenya and Ethiopia. Empowering families to come out of extreme poverty, not for a week or for a month or for a year, but permanently. But before I talk about what we do at Nuru and how we go about that, I want, first I want to talk about the problem. Because how we define the problem greatly impacts how we design solutions. The World Bank says that extreme poverty is those who live on less than $1.25 a day. But what I have found in my time is that's an extremely limiting definition that oftentimes leads to material-based solutions that simply do not last. So I kept digging in my research, and I came across the work of these two gentlemen, Makbul Bahak, the former Minister of Finance in Pakistan, and Amartya Sen, a Nobel Prize-winning economist. You see, these guys believe that extreme poverty is a lack of meaningful choices for basic human rights in addition to the lack of resources. Now this made a heck of a lot more sense to me. This is what I had seen in that man's eyes on Highway 7, that poor Iraqi farmer, the desperation that he faced without choice. And you see, when you start focusing on this definition as the definition you're trying to solve for, your solutions, your targets, your goals become very different. Instead of number of wells drilled, number of schools built, number of clinics built, your goals become number of leaders who are empowered to make choices number of leaders who are equipped to design those solutions, and an enabling environment where they can act on the decisions that they're making and implement the solutions that they're building. And this is a very different type of goal and aim in the fight against extreme poverty. But over the last five years at Nuru, I've built a model with my team around this goal in, in attempting to end extreme poverty. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to build the world's first self-sustaining, self-scaling, integrated development model to end extreme poverty. Now, integrated models make a lot of sense. We focus in agriculture, economic development, healthcare, and education. And they make sense because, you know, if you just increase crop yields, the children are still dying from malaria or waterborne illnesses, diminishing your impact. So they make a lot of sense. However, the challenge is that no one's really ever figured out how to make these things sustainable or scalable. And that's really where our IP comes in. You see, at Nuru, we've designed what we call a sustainability engine. Our goal is to go into these countries in over a seven-year period build out the capacity of local leaders to be able to design world-class solutions to solve their own problems. We leave seven years later, leaving behind a completely self-contained entity that's impacting about approximately 50,000 people and continuing to scale to other villages and communities to end poverty in those areas completely independent of us. Now, how do we do that? Our sustainability engine focuses on two key fuels that we think every organization and company needs to continue going, to, to be sustainable, and that's leaders, and capital. I want to focus on capital first. At Nuru, we built a for-profit company, a social enterprise, that is a diversified, scalable business. And we're attempting over the seven years life cycle of our project for this company to grow, become profitable, and then the company is legally structured such that those profits have to be driven back into subsidize the cost of the nonprofit side, completely independent of donors and philanthropy at that point. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, this is really attractive to our investors. They get really excited about this because they can leverage their investment much further than with other options. But this is not what I get excited about. I get excited about the second part of our engine, the part about leaders. And it's based on a fundamental discovery that I've made in the, in the last five years in the bush. And that's this. When you first go to an area to work, instead of starting by asking what, start by focusing on who. Instead of saying what is the solution we should do? What is the intervention? What is the program we should start with? Start by focusing on who. You see, this business is about leaders. This is about people. And the greatest lesson I have learned is that the best ideas in fighting poverty lie within those trapped in poverty themselves. And untapping that potential is the true key, the secret, to being able to stop extreme poverty. But we have a problem. You see, leadership isn't sexy. You can't touch it. You can't taste it. You can't put it in a box and put your name on it and label it. And that's led the industry to fund a lot of other material-based solutions. But I'm challenging us 
to move the conversation back to focusing on developing and equipping leaders. And that's why over the last five years at Nuru, we've developed a unique approach to training and equipping leaders. We equip leaders to be able to understand need in their communities, design world-class solutions to address those needs based on best practices of other organizations from around the world, implement and scale those solutions using effective project management tools, and then innovate past challenges that they will face, face after we leave using good design thinking methodology. By doing this, our leaders take so much more ownership. When we leave, when the model breaks, they can fix it. Because guess what? They helped build it. You see here a picture of one of our farm groups. The lady on the left is an incredible leader. One of 300 that we're training in Kenya right now. Her name is Milka Marwa. When I first met Milka, I was walking in the bush in 2008 in rural Kenya. Milka came to me in a desperate situation. She had six children. Two of them had died the previous year from malaria. The six she had right now were starving because she could only produce three bags of maize for her one acre, and her family needed six to survive. She was in a desperate situation. She came to me and she said, I need help. I said, great. I'm this smart Stanford kid here. I've got all these great ideas. I'm going to tell you all the things we're going to do. We're going to do this program, this program, this program. Stop. She interrupted me. Stop. I said, excuse me? She said, stop. What I need from you is I need you to listen. You see, I've lived in this village with these other 10 women in my group for the last 40 years struggling with this problem. We've got some really good ideas. What we need from you is we need you to listen to us and help us get started. I was totally taken aback. I did not expect this. I did not expect to find the answers to these problems locked within the people who were suffering from poverty. And over the next five years, Milka became one of my chief instructors in helping me understand the power of unlocking the potential in these leaders. She's one of 300 in the villages that we're working in now. And if you go back to the area in Kenya, <clears throat> you will find a strong, brave, inspiring woman leading her community. She started out leading 10 farmers. Now she's a field manager in charge of 500 farm families. And I'll tell you what, this woman is sassy. She cracks the whip. In those villages, I stay clear of her because I'm afraid of her. <laughs> she is an amazing woman. And there are so many more stories like that that I could tell you. But the challenge that we have in front of us right now in extreme poverty is daunting. It is the greatest crisis of our time today. And just to talk to you about the urgency, you know, I, I get guys telling me all the time, asking me questions all the time. What, what's with the sense of urgency? What's with the intensity about this problem? You see, I faced far too much unnecessary death in my time. And when I go to bed every single night, you know what I see? I see the eyes of that man on Highway 7 looking at me and the desperation in his eyes, and it simply won't go away. This is the greatest crisis of our time today. I want to share a staggering statistic that, that helps you bring home this sense of this urgency, a statistic that's very near and dear to me. In the last 237 years of American history, 1.3 million Americans have lost their lives in combat. Many of them have been my brothers. But there are more people dying from causes related to extreme poverty every single month. 1.5 million people in our world today die every month from causes related to extreme poverty. That is staggering. I can't even fathom that. And they're dying from completely preventable causes. You see, when I look in our world today, I, I see that we have put a glass ceiling on this problem of extreme poverty. I see a lot of large organizations and governments fighting to see really who can get as close to that glass ceiling as possible, but we've tricked ourselves into believing that no one can actually break through the glass ceiling. Well, at Nuru, we're partnering with a lot of other brave heroes in this industry to, to, to start a movement to break through that glass ceiling. We can do that. In our generation, this problem can be and needs to be solved. But to do this, we have to realize one thing. She is the key. Unlocking the leadership potential in brave leaders trapped in poverty like Milka Marwa is the key to success in fighting extreme poverty. So my ask of you today is this. Help me change the conversation about extreme poverty from what to who. Thank you.